Although seagrasses clearly have this amazing ecosystem service role, unfortunately, like the majority of our coastal environment, they're under incredible levels of stress. And over the, the long term, there's very, very good evidence that globally seagrass meadows have been decimated and continue to be under threat. And in many parts of the world, that loss is, is quite alarming. But we understand a lot about seagrasses. We understand that they're plants. And as I outlined in some of the earlier lectures, their, their requirements for life is, is quite simple. And, and therefore, actually, it, it is possible to manage these systems into the future. And it's those concepts that I want to talk about today in this lecture. There's a, a paper published back in uh, 2009 by Michelle Waycott in PNAS. Very out of date now, and uh, I, I'm actually part of a, uh, a grouping that's trying to revisit that analysis because it is, is very old. But what they did is estimate that approximately 58% of seagrass meadows globally have lost part of their distribution. So you know, if that was a meadow in a bay, um, then that meadow is probably uh, shrunk in size because of anthropogenic impact. And when, when, when those authors analysed that, that loss rate since 1980, where the, the better, um, more quantitative data exists, they were able to understand that two football pitches worth of seagrass were being lost per hour. So as you watch this uh, lecture, two football pitches, two Anfields, two Old Traffords would have been lost because um, of some form of anthropogenic uh, pressure. And you can see here on the, the left of this slide, there's an unimpacted healthy seagrass meadow that's supporting biodiversity, it's trapping carbon out of the atmosphere, it's producing oxygen, it's filtering compounds that are coming off the, off the land, it's cycling nutrients, all these kind of incredibly um, rare species, the dugongs, the green turtles, are being supported by seagrass. These fisheries are being supported by seagrass. But unfortunately, then you turn to the right diagram and you see an impacted system that's being subjected to excess runoff from catchments. It's, it's not supporting the uh, stabilisation of the beach. <clears throat> Many of those species that are associated to it have long gone. And the carbon that was in the uh, sediments is being uh, remobilised and oxidised and ending up back in the, uh, the atmosphere. Not a great scenario. When we look at that data that exists um, over the last hundred years and, and um, also since 1980, we see that the majority of the, the meadows that are being assessed over uh, the long term are decreasing in size. And that, that uh, decline is actually increasing very very rapidly. That study from <coughs> uh, Michelle Waycott actually underlines a very important issue in uh, marine science and that is the um, <coughs> I guess focus of uh, scientific research around countries that have the, the money to conduct that research and the presence of marine research stations where work tends to be focused around. Not surprising therefore that <clears throat> the majority of the long-term studies of seagrass are focused around Europe, North America um, and Australasia and uh, Japan. <clears throat> Unfortunately <clears throat> across the whole continent of Africa we have, we have one long-term study. When we look at somewhere like Southeast Asia, 
that probably has the greatest distribution of seagrass anywhere on the planet, there are no long-term studies. So although that study is alarming in itself, it's also very, very biased in where we have data from. So we know nothing about kind of key parts of the, the tropical um, seagrass systems over the long term. As a result of that, we, we wanted to understand something about seagrasses in Indonesia. And uh, as you can see, there's, there's no long term data available. And what we did is we resorted to what's referred to as expert witnesses. So someone who's been working in marine science for um, 30 years may not have conducted a seagrass monitoring program for 30 years. But in, in that 30 year period, they may have been out in a in a seagrass meadow. They might have done a lot of work in a bay and a, developed a, a very detailed knowledge about the, the seagrass and the other marine resources that are present in that area. And although that's not quantitative uh, data, <clears throat> given the fact that they are trained in marine science, they have particular interest and expertise in seagrass, then that information is actually quite valuable. And to dismiss it as being um, not useful, um, I guess, um, I think is wrong. What we did is we found that in Indonesia there are a huge amount of universities um, many of them don't have much um, in the way of research funding, but they, they have very um, um, clever academic staff who've been out doing things in seagrass for, for many years and observing seagrass, taking students out to bays, doing things that we might do with our students in Swansea. And we got all these, these academics and some of them conservation um, workers, some, some of them are government um, staff doing marine science work. And we got all these people together in a, in a workshop <clears throat> to explain the, the, the status of the seagrasses around their region. Not surprisingly, the gross majority of those scientists told us <clears throat> that they had good evidence that seagrass have been lost in their parts of uh, Indonesia. Um, only two of the sites in uh, north, uh, northeast Sulawesi and uh, um, um, the Spice Islands, um, where there's very low population density, low levels of industry, not much catchment runoff, um, there have been no loss or degradation of seagrasses. Everywhere else, people were describing extensive loss of seagrass. They were describing places where there were whole bays that used to contain seagrasses and those seagrasses no longer occurred. And as part of that uh, workshop that we ran, run to, to bring that information together, each one of these individuals presented a level of anecdotal information about those seagrasses uh, using photos, descriptions, um, I guess studies that may not have been um, time dependent but they they characterized the seagrasses 30 years ago uh, or that they characterized the the loss um, in, a, in a local sense and haven't been uh, published so what we can see here from, from that level of data is that those those findings from michelle waycott in 2009 although they're spatially limited are actually quite indicative of seagrass loss all around the world. Seagrass is being damaged in the Southeast Asian region, um, principally because of rapid economic development. Populations are surging, we've got a massive growing middle class, um, the mining industries, the forestry industries booming uh, in, in places like um, Borneo, uh, Kalimantan, we, we have a huge growth in, in palm plantations and with that 
We have a lot of loss of seagrass. <coughs> So what are these threats? Um, you know, they, they vary from the, the agricultural runoff, the pesticides, the uh, increased level of um, nutrients, shipping incidents, boating incidents, just port development, a whole range of things that are disturbing our coastal environment. And that's taking this uh, productive diverse habitat, this good fish habitat, this great carbon sink, into this unproductive low diversity habitat that is um, of limited benefit to uh, society. Unfortunately, although we know there's a very strong link between seagrasses and fisheries, there's very limited studies, that, very few studies, that have actually characterised a fishery and a fishery that's very well supported by seagrass and observe the consequences of um, loss of seagrass on that uh, fishery. A very good example, although not tropical, comes from uh, um, South Australia, the King George Whiting in northern Spencer Gulf is known to be very, very closely associated to sea seagrass, uh, using it as a, um, <coughs> um, a nursery uh, habitat. Uh, critical periods of it of its, its life cycle and during the uh, um, uh, the late 90s there's a very big El Nino event and that, that increased the the sea surface temperature of those uh, those uh, areas of seagrass in that region and uh, there's also a particular extreme period of extreme uh, low tides and those low tides <coughs> Corresponded to very very high UV light because of the um, the lack of ozone, and in the middle of the day, uh, shallow tides uh, and also the intertidal, though those uh, seagrasses basically superheated, and uh, what we refer to as burning happened. Obviously, they didn't burn in that they um, um, they went on fire. They, uh, they blackened because they uh, they died and it basically looks like they've, they've been burned but they're, they're blackened because they're dead and 16% uh, loss of seagrass happened in that region and uh, that resulted in a very very sharp decline in the productivity of the, the fishery of the King George uh, whiting so a nice example of uh, how seagrasses uh, decline uh, uh, Fisheries decline as a result of uh, loss of seagrass. So, how do nutrients really damage seagrass? So, you know, going back to the tomato plants, if you don't feed your tomato plants, they will die. That means you need to give them some um, level of nutrients. And uh, so, here on the on the the left of this slide there's this uh, situation of no seagrass so you get places particularly in the um, in the Pacific regions where you get small islands there's very little in the way of uh, nutrients present on that island running off and uh, you get a very oligotrophic environment with a reef around it reef flat a lot of sediments there uh, kind of uh, brilliant place for, for seagrasses to, to, to grow sort of lagoon environment behind the reef nice and sheltered but there's no seagrass there and that's because there's not enough nutrients then what happens is someone comes along to that island and uh, builds a, um, a resort maybe a golf course maybe some sort of fancy pad with lots of nice lawns on it and to, to make that happen they need to add nutrients to the system maybe they uh, they also don't treat their their sewage particularly well so the nutrients are, are going out into the sea uh, also suddenly you get seagrass doing quite well and uh, that can uh, be great for for biodiversity for productivity of the local fisheries but in terms of the tourist resort they tend to be like oh we don't want this green stuff and uh, quickly that's that seagrass gets to this point of being optimal habitat it's got a supply of nutrients and uh, 
Um, we've got this nice small resort that's uh, pushing a bit of nutrient into the water. But then a whole series of other uh, resorts decide, hmm, we're, we're going to build build a, a hotel there too. That's looking like a great place for a golfing industry. So suddenly there's 10 resorts and uh, they're pushing too much nutrient into the water. Um, with all this excess nutrient in the water, microalgae recognises that there's a huge surface area upon those lovely fresh seagrass blades which they can settle and grow and that they can use the, the, micro, the, the nutrients that are in the water to proliferate. And suddenly those seagrasses are getting smothered by epiphytes. That's reducing their capacity as seagrasses to, to grow and photosynthesize and uh, they may not be so productive. With all that nutrient coming into the water column, you start to get more and more um, phytoplankton present, which reduces the light. You start to get more benthic macroalgae um, growing in that system. And suddenly you're in a situation where the seagrasses are declining. Sometimes you might get some grazers coming in to, to consume some of that, uh, that algae. And uh, that can help uh, keep the, uh, the seagrass alive as the, uh, the nutrients increase. But ultimately, if you put too many nutrients into that, that system, then the seagrasses will uh, wither away and die because they, they no longer have enough light to live. So you're going for this kind of this image at the top, really nice clear water, seagrass is looking quite clean, um, to this situation at the bottom, where those seagrasses are, are smothered in really high, high levels of microalgae. Well, this is a, a temperate example. This is a, a Stramford Lock. It kind of illustrates the, uh, um, the situation quite well. Stramford Lock in Northern Ireland um, has very good records in the long term of um, vast levels of, of seagrass, uh, very sheltered enclosed sort of um, lagoon type of area, estuarine lagoon, and uh, all the, the agriculture uncontrolled in that region elevated the, the nutrients into, into Strangford Lock. Um, a lot of the, the mussels and the, the oysters were dredged out that helped filter the water, and hey presto, uh, the seagrasses got smothered by excess levels of uh, macroalgae. Um, Ulva became the dominant species in Stratford Lock. So when we talk about um, damage catchments and poor catchment management, <coughs> we, we need to think not just about the, the pollutants that are going into the water, uh, the, the nutrients, the, the chemicals, the fertilizers, the, the pesticides, the herbicides, um, the oils, we also need to think about the, um, the structure of that river. Now, the, the picture on the, uh, on the top right shows a, uh, a river bank where there is no uh, riparian vegetation. There are no trees growing on that. It's very simple that if you put trees and vegetation around a, uh, a river bank, it sort of acts like a, a filter. And uh, when you get a storm, uh, flooding coming in uh, and all those uh, uh, any kind of um, sediment on the land um, washes away the uh, the trees the vegetation will slow that movement down so you don't get heavy pulses of, uh, of sediments coming down the uh, um, the catchment and uh, the bottom right image is a uh, uh, a sediment plume coming out from a uh, a river in northern uh, northern Queensland and uh, this is the uh, the Daintree River if any of you have ever been up there a uh, fantastic part of the world but um, although it's part of a world heritage area a uh, lots of uh, the uh, the upper catchments of that uh, um, that river um, are actually damaged like the, the picture um, on the top right and that means that you get a huge amount of uh, sediment coming down that uh, that uh, catchment and uh, and reaching the coast, and uh, for periods of time that can smother the seagrass. And if that repetitively happens and the seagrass 
it's not in a great state it can't deal with those prolonged levels of uh, a light reduction and uh, ultimately that can damage the seed. A much smaller scale impact but uh, uh, an impact that happens um, with high frequency and over wide uh, areas is that of boat impacts. So there's no reason why boating activity can't happen in harmony with seagrass. Um, we have lots of uh, ways of creating um, mooring systems that don't damage seagrass. People have often bought, built um, pontoons to go out into the deep. You can design pontoons to, to be seagrass friendly. But the reality is that uh, seagrasses are shallow water. People don't understand where they are, why they're important. And, uh, and how their boating activity might impact upon that uh, seagrass. But if you, uh, you come into a shallow bay, you don't know that area, it's low tide, then it's very easy for you to, to hit your propeller onto that seagrass. And uh, as you can see on the, on the right hand side, top right, there's a, a propeller scar that's gone th straight through the, uh, the seagrass meadow. And uh, that's ripping up that uh, seagrass and uh, you know, if that happens every 10 years, it's probably not a, a problem. But if you've got lots of vessels in a, in a bay and uh, they're all doing that uh, once a year, then that becomes a huge impact. And th there's actually images on Google Earth where you can actually see a sort of like a crazy crisscross matrix across seagrass meadows where, the, where there's hundreds of these, these lines that have been uh, uh, ripped out of the, uh, the seagrass. But it's not just that direct uh, um, damage by a propeller. It's also behavior that, that redistributes um, uh, sediments that can also be problematic. And uh, uh, you can see the, the bottom left image. That individual in that boat may not have actually um, hit the seagrass at all. It might have been just above the, the sediment. But by um, not traveling uh, slowly, and actually revving its engine at quite high speed through that uh, that seagrass, uh, even if it's not hitting the seagrass, it is redistributing all the sediment uh, into the water column, and ultimately that creates these little plumes, which then uh, um, will actually land on patches of seagrass and cause disturbance that ultimately ends up in reducing the light availability, uh, stressing out the seagrass, and uh, ultimately causing decline of that, uh, that meadow. Then a, a, an additional sort of direct physical impact um, is that from, uh, from mooring scars. So if you have a, a boat mooring uh, that's, that's anchored to a, a concrete block in a, in a seagrass meadow, then um, that in itself um, doesn't need to create any more impact than the, uh, the area of the block. But what we know is that typically um, boat moorings historically have been uh, created using heavy chain. And as the tide goes up and down and as the, the wind moves back and to, that causes the, the boat to pull around um, on its central point. And that chain is part of the, the anchoring system, the weighting system. It's designed then to, to dangle, to drag on the sediment because that stops the, uh, the boat moving and jerking so, uh, so readily. But that chain has a very, very negative impact um, upon the seagrass. Those links just kind of catch and grab and catch and grab and catch and grab. And with it, they tear the seagrass away. And in this image, this is a, a satellite image from um, North Wales, but there's lots of uh, um, tropical examples of this in, in Florida, um, in Indonesia, um, in Australia. And what you see are these little um, halos in the seagrass. Actually, they're not that little. Um, we did some work in the UK showing that these can. 40 50 meters squared worth of uh, seagrass that has been uh, lost because of uh, 
uh, inappropriate uh, mooring use. The uh, the great side the great side of this the story is that there are improvements you can make to um, ensure that uh, that that recovery can happen. There's the systems now that don't drag on the uh, the seagrass. Um, you can use rope moorings that, that don't damage the uh, the seagrass, and therefore you can offer the seagrass an opportunity um, to recover. Seagrasses I talked about previously are important sites for um, for fishing activity, and uh, as a result, they're also uh, a fishing uh, site for for bait. So people might go and um, collect worms, um, bivalves, all sorts of different species that they can use uh, for bait. And uh, that's alongside some of the, uh, the collection activity. But bait, bait digging uh, tends to be more physical. Uh, it's less about gleaning other invertebrates off the, the seagrass, and it's more about digging down to get worms, to get uh, species that are living uh, in the sediment. So it tends to be a bit more aggressive um, activity and we see it all around the world. Uh, the only photo, good photo I've got of this is uh, from a, uh, um, a meadow again in, in Northern Ireland. But we, we, we clearly see this in, uh, you know, in, in parts of the tropic because I've done a lot of work in, in Southeast Asia and I've regularly seen people with iron bars out, kind of spades, all sorts of things looking for, for bait under the sediment. So seagrass are also damaged by flooding. So <clears throat> flooding can be helpful for seagrasses in some contexts. If you uh, are, are pristine or quite a, a natural system, and then it's bringing down uh, freshwater pulses that sometimes helps with uh, germination of seeds. It can bring down that, uh, that helpful amount of nutrients. Uh, but typically, um, Flooding tends to um, come down with a lot more because of anthropogenic disturbance um, up the, um, the catchment. And uh, here's a, uh, a flood plume taken from the, uh, um, the air. And you can see it sort of comes across like a wall that's moving out to sea um, and uh, typically resulting in, in very uh, turbid water that uh, reduces the light availability of seagrasses. And what you can see is, is that um, the, the light availability um, in clear water goes to a lot deeper um, and therefore we've got seagrasses living at greater depth. But uh, when it's turbid, there's only light available in, the, in the, uh, the upper reaches of that water column. And that means that some of the deeper seagrasses, they're uh, therefore uh, quickly knocked out because they, they, can't, they can't survive in that uh, uh, low light setting. Sometimes that can uh, result in extreme kind of levels of uh, sedimentation. And uh, here's a, a, a neat example, rather sad, from the, the Great Barrier Reef, where um, the result of a, a flood plume, the huge amounts of sediment came down, and those sediments kind of circulated, circulated within a, a, a particular embayment, and then settled. And uh, that dumped a huge sediment plume on top of seagrass, completely smothered it, and uh, seagrass is completely and utterly disappeared in a very short space of time. Sadly, there's a lot of diverse impacts upon seagrass meadows around the world. Um, because seagrass is a, a shallow water habitat, so they're, they're clear water, they, they increase the clarity of the uh, water column. It's, help stabilize some of those sediments, they're great places to put aquaculture. And uh, sometimes that can be at a very uh, low intensity, um, but it tends to uh, never end up that way. And uh, there's an increasing proliferation of uh, um, seaweed aquaculture throughout uh, the, the tropics, particularly Southeast Asia um, and the Indian Ocean. And that in itself 
is not necessarily a big impact, but it's when it becomes extensive. And uh, these guys in the, the bottom left and the, the guy in the uh, top right are laying lines of, uh, of seaweed um, out to sea. And uh, they, they're doing it in those, those shallow seawater areas. And uh, typically what they're doing is uh, putting a weight at one end of a line. They put floats along that line and uh, they put another weight at the other end. And all along that line, they have bits of seaweed tied into the rope and uh, that very rapidly grows. Great environment for the, uh, the seaweed. And uh, typically by having high levels of that, you start blocking off the, the light to the seagrass. By having so much uh, dominant one species uh, uh, seaweed in that uh, seagrass meadow, the, uh, um, the production of, base, of various algal surfactants um, leads to a change in the, the sea, seawater chemistry. Se seagrasses don't like that. You get more turbidity. Um, you get more disturbance because of the uh, the farmers coming in and out of that environment to uh, to tend to their to their um, and their seaweed and to collect it and uh, and with it ultimately the uh, the seagrass becomes um, very damaged. Unfortunately, also other types of aquaculture can also damage seagrass. Um, large fish pens. Uh, the huge amounts of excess nutrients, the huge amounts of uh, excess organic uh, enrichment from the, uh, the overfeeding of the fish and the uh, excretion of those uh, fish. And uh, ultimately that uh, leads to a, a change in the, the nutrient um, environment in that uh, seagrass meadow, increasing sedimentation happening, uh, lots of additional other nasties that go with it, uh, from the herbicides, the pesticides to the um, um, various cleaning agents that are used and uh, that is known to, to damage seagrass. And, uh, there's a whole series of uh, other sort of nasty example images of that. It doesn't necessarily have to happen um, in the water. Sometimes that aquaculture can be on land and have huge uh, impacts. Sadly, the uh, um, the coastal um, world wants to expand into the ocean and that's because in places of um, high attraction for investors, for people to live, the, the coastal uh, zone is finite in resources. So there are only a certain amount of houses that can be uh, built along the, uh, the seashore and those, those houses go for a premium. The developers all around the world have dreamed up all sorts of crazy uh, ways that they can develop the coast. Sometimes that's just with building marinas. Sometimes it's uh, kind of through land reclamation and sometimes it's an extreme level of uh, land reclamation uh, that creates all these sort of uh, um, uh, structures going right out to sea. And uh, uh, the, uh, um, the Middle East region, there's uh, growing economic wealth in that region, growing interest in people living there, and uh, with it people growing, uh, building ever bigger and bigger and more kind of uh, uh, crazy uh, developments, um, such as the world and the drier palm. And with that, you're moving huge amounts of sediment around, you're changing the contours of the coast. Ultimately, there is a potential to, to create future habitat for seagrasses, but at least in the, uh, the short term, you end up creating a scenario where the, uh, uh, the seagrasses are uh, uh, massively damaged by mega dredging projects. These sorts of uh, uh, modifications also happen at the, the small scale. You know, I know of examples in the UK where um, the RNLI um, expanded their, their, their buildings without much in the way of um, um, environmental impact assessment because they were an R and a lie, they were let, let to do what, whatever they wanted, and uh, that resulted in uh, uh, small-scale damage to, to seagrass. There's lots of examples of this throughout the tropics.
I guess I mentioned earlier the, the negative impacts of um, uh, bait digging on, uh, on seagrasses, but fishing activity generally in seagrasses can be um, uh, sometimes quite uh, um, intensive and uh, destructive. Top left uh, image are trawlers, uh, prawn trawlers operating on the, the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, they're typically uh, going over seagrasses, and uh, you can see that they're disturbing the sediment, putting sediment plumes up into the water column, and uh, damaging the seagrass. Unfortunately, people still use all sorts of um, destructive fishing uh, methods, such as blast fishing, poison fishing, and an example of this is uh, a few years ago, I was doing some work out in Turks and Caicos Islands in, in the uh, Caribbean region. And we, we observed people coming out of a, a supermarket with whole trolleys full of bleach. First, first time I saw it, I didn't really think much of it. But I saw it again, I was like, I'm sure I've seen this happen before. And after a number of discussions with fishermen, stakeholders, um, fisheries managers in that uh, area. It turns out that people actively bleach fish. So what that means is they they go out on a boat with a little squeezy bottle of bleach and uh, seagrasses on the the sort of uh, the continental shelf of uh, around the Turks and Caicos parts of the Bahamas shelf. You very commonly get these sort of step um, structures in uh, in the seagrass meadows and you get these big overhangs and uh, those overhangs are, are really great for um, a spiny lobster they're really great for um, some of the, uh, the, the groupers uh, some of the snappers um, what people do is duck dive down to two three meter depth maximum squeeze the bleach into those uh, um, overhangs and the fish come out a bit stunned um, but they're flushed out very rapidly and they scoop them up in their net. That damages the seagrass, it damages other marine uh, wildlife and uh, is a pretty hideous um, uh, method of fishing. Illegal obviously, but people do it. Um, lack of resources are able to sort of police these uh, activities. Many parts of the world blast fishing still happens with, with dynamite. That also happens in, in seagrasses. It's very well documented in coral reef habitats, but it, it also happens in, uh, in seagrass. But overfishing is also a huge problem in uh, um, um, seagrass meadows. And uh, that's not just in terms of the, uh, the actual amount of fish, but the, the changing food web that happens um, over time. You go from a situation where um, you've got a, a complex um, balanced food web with herbivores, predators, meso racers, all sorts of uh, different uh, species um, occupying different niches. Slowly but surely, as you uh, you keep increasing your, your fishing pressure on it, then uh, um, that food web changes. And uh, here's, a, here's a, uh, a graph from some uh, data we collected in uh, parts of the Philippines. Uh, we we um, um, we use local ecological knowledge to understand the the decli declining status of a, a fishery that uh, you know over a, a 20 to 30 year period um, has actually um, done a third uh, of the productivity it used to be. Sometimes we have uh, also problems of, of disease, less well documented in the the tropics. Um, or a, a temperate seagrass problem, but it is also uh, partially a problem in the uh, in the. As you might expect, um, all these different threats to to seagrasses um, change as you as you uh, as you go around the world. You know, um, that disease example was a is a problem in uh, the northern northern temperate region, but not necessarily in some of the tropical areas. And uh, here's a, a vulnerability analysis using sort of expert data to understand uh, all the impacts to uh, seagrasses around the world. And uh, what they're, they're showing really is that sort of um, urban development is one of the, uh, um, the big 
urban development, port infrastructure development is one of the big uh, impacts upon seagrasses um, in uh, the tropical Indo-Pacific. Um, but um, agricultural runoff is the, the biggest in uh, um, the uh, North Atlantic region. So it varies um, with region. This is a paper by Alana Grech in Environmental uh, Research Letters. Historically, seagrasses have been sort of seen as the, uh, the ugly duckling of marine conservation. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we suspect that they've undergone such dramatic loss um, and that management actions haven't been put in place to reverse that, uh, um, that problem. Whether it's uh, research or conservation funding, the, uh, um, the focus of marine conservation and marine research goes against seagrass. If we look at the amount of publications on coral reefs uh, versus mangroves versus seagrass versus salt marsh, seagrasses aren't really doing very well. And uh, they really are, are struggling. And uh, this is a log scale of the, on the uh, graph uh, A, the top. You can see that uh, the amount of uh, um, um, philanthropic uh, research and conservation donors um, to on, on seagrass is, is minuscule relative to, to that of uh, coral reefs. And this is despite, despite increasing reports of uh, seagrass. But ultimately, we are beginning to um, reverse that, uh, that um, trajectory. There's increasing interest in, in seagrasses and increasing understanding of how we can uh, um, improve their management and um, make them resilient into the, uh, the future. And the next part of this lecture is going to be about developing uh, that uh, resilience and how we can think about improving their management into the future.